And joining me now is Republican Senator Ben Sass of the great state of Nebraska. He was one of the questioners of Judge Gorsuch during today's confirmation hearing. Uh, Senator Sass, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Jake. Good to be here. So um, I think a lot of pundits are giving Judge Gorsuch uh, very high reviews uh, for his performance today. Um, take a listen to one interesting moment uh, when Judge Gorsuch was asked about Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade decided in 1973 as a precedent of the United States Supreme Court. It has been reaffirmed, so a good judge will consider it as precedent of the United States Supreme Court, worthy as treatment of precedent like any other. The only question I have about this is that, I don't know if you read the book, but Judge Gorsuch wrote a book against assisted suicide. And while the book in no way specifically talks about abortion, I think it's fair to wonder, to read the book and wonder how much the moral arguments he makes about life perhaps could apply to that. For instance, he writes uh, in favor of bans on assisted suicide and, and euthanasia, quote, on the basis that human life is fundamentally and inherently valuable and that the intentional taking of human life by private persons is always wrong, unquote. I don't know if you read the book, like I said, but I, I wonder, not is it unfair to wonder if he might apply those moral views on life to his rulings if abortion were to come up? Great and fair question for us to deliberate about as long as we make a very clear delineation of two different things. So one, really hard and important questions to have about the vulnerable end of life and beginning of life questions. I am a solidly pro-life guy. I care deeply about these issues and I'd like us to be talking about it more in American life, to be honest. But that's a different thing than what he's interviewing for today. The president has nominated him to serve on the Supreme Court and a judge's job is not to make law. A judge's law job is to defend all of our constitutional rights and the Bill of Rights in light of the precedential questions that he's been talking about. So he has another book besides the one you're talking about. I actually haven't read that. I've read in it. I've seen excerpts of his book about assisted suicide and whatnot. But he has another book on stare decisis and on the role of precedent. And that's been a key part of a lot of our hearing questions today. And it's pretty clear that this guy isn't running for the Supreme Court as if it's an election or a campaign so he could be a super senator or a super precedent. president. He believes in law as he receives it, not law as he wishes it to be. You've been, you've been critical of President Trump, um, particularly when he was the Republican nominee. I wonder, how confident are you that Judge Gorsuch, if confirmed, will stand up to the Trump White House if they exceed bounds of the executive branch powers? A hundred percent confident. Uh, I believe that Judge Gorsuch is a judge's judge. He's a guy who believes in three separate but equal branches of government. The founders built this amazing document, the Constitution, that's about principled pluralism and about limited government and about distinguishing and dividing the three different what the founders called departments. We call branches of government, but fundamentally the distinction between legislation and execution or administration of the laws is a fundamental part of our constitutional architecture. And and this guy believes in all three branches, and I don't think the guy has any concern the day after he's confirmed whether a Democrat or a Republican put him on the court. He cares about the three branches, not the two parties. Let's turn to the subject of uh, President Trump and, and the Russian uh, situation. O on the day that President Trump first made the false wiretap allegations against President Obama, you released a fairly powerful statement that read in part, quote, we are in the midst of a civilization warping crisis of public trust, and the president's allegations today demand the thorough and dispassionate attention of serious patriots. Well, it did receive such attention. It is found to be completely unsubstantiated and was even disputed. I would even go so far as to say rebuked uh, in some ways by the head of the FBI. Now, I know that your criticism of the lack of public trust goes far beyond President Trump. But do you think that the leader of this nation, the leader of your party, understands the crisis that you speak about so eloquently? And how concerned are you that, that he's contributing to it? Yeah, I, I don't know really what motivates a lot of the things that the president says and does and prioritizes. For instance, he nominated a great guy to be on the Supreme Court, and that should be dominating all the headlines of this week. And sometimes the White House gets in its own way and changes the subject from things they should be wanting to talk about, like Neil Gorsuch, which, again, great nomination by President Trump. And then we get off onto other issues. Here's what I know. I know that America as a republic can only survive if we are passing 
on to the next generation a sense that the most important things in life are not primarily political. They're neighborhoods and schools and churches and synagogues and workplaces and the PTA and the Rotary Club. And if we believe those things, then we have to have a government that has a framework for ordered liberty that we build and pass on together. And that requires shared facts. The president and the Congress by funding and declaring war at times, obviously, but the president as commander in chief is regularly going to have to send our sons and daughters into harm's way in battles against jihadis and in the future of cyber warfare. It's critically important that we have a shared reservoir of public trust. And I would love to see more people in Washington taking a 10 and 20 year perspective instead of a news cycle long perspective. So yeah, you're right. I'm worried about the civilization warping crisis of public trust. Sounds like quite a mouthful there. Uh, but that's how I feel it in my phones when I worry at night about the America that we're passing on. That isn't about the last two months. That isn't about the last year's election cycle. But it's about something that's decades long when we have a decreasing sense of shared facts. And obviously, since the end of the Cold War 27 years ago, we face different kinds of enemies. We need our intelligence community to do really important and hard stuff for us abroad. And we need a commander in chief that goes out and tells the American people the story and the service of those families that are involved in the intelligence community. I want us to be focusing on those things that should bring us together because we've got a lot of work to do. Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska, thank you.